This is the story. (laughs) Stories of people, of nations, of the world, of yesterday and today, and the meaning they hold for tomorrow. Tonight, Charles Lawton and Norman Corwin's production of Thomas Wolfe. Thomas Wolfe died six years ago at the age of 37. He'd been ill for months and had a hunch he wasn't going to get better. In the last letter he ever wrote, he said, I'm sneaking this against orders, but I've got a hunch... I wanted to write these words to you. I've made a long voyage and been to a strange country and I've seen the dark man very close. And I don't think I was too much afraid of him. But so much of mortality still clings to me. I wanted most desperately to live and still do. And I thought about you all a thousand times and wanted to see you all again. And there was the impossible anguish and regret of all the work I had not done, of all the work I had to do. He died a year before the formal opening of World War II, and six years before the Nazis fell to lynching American flyers. But even that long ago, Wolf had seen enough of fascism to realize it would have to be totally destroyed before men could live in security. Hitlerism, he wrote, was a recrudescence of an old barbarism. It's racial nonsense and cruelty. It's naked worship of brute force. It's suppression of truth and resort to lies and myths. It's ruthless contempt for the individual. Each of these is a throwback to that spirit of lust and greed and force which has always been the true enemy of mankind. But this spirit is not confined to Germany. It belongs to no one race. One sees traces of it everywhere. It takes on many disguises, many labels. America has it, too, in various forms. For wherever ruthless men conspire together for their own ends, wherever the rule of dog-eat-dog is dominant, there it breeds. Its roots sink down into something primitive, and these roots will somehow have to be eradicated if man is to win his ultimate freedom and not be plunged back into savagery and perish utterly from the earth. This Wolf wrote years before it became clear to most people that the roots of fascism would indeed have to be destroyed. He knew instinctively there wasn't room enough on this earth for both fascism and democracy. But mainly, however, he wrote with enormous zest about America the America he felt so keenly. Always in his writing was the patriotism of a spirit who loved passionately every square inch of the vast canvas of the states. Today, when an American fighting man overseas says, Gosh, I'd like to be back home, just to be there for a little furlough and kind of take it easy for a couple of weeks. You know what I mean? Just to be home. Likely as not, the physical America he remembers and thinks of is pretty close to what Tom Wolfe remembered and thought of. Likely as not, it's Wolfe's image of home that the G.I. longs to return to after total victory is won. An America of cities and towns and wilderness, of rivers and railroads. An America probably lying somewhere between the lines of Wolfe you will hear tonight. America. 
America is a fabulous country. The only fabulous country. It is the place where miracles not only happen, but they happen all the time. It is the place of the howling winds, of the hurrying of leaves in October, the place of fierce bitten colors in October, and all of the wild sweet woods flame up. It is the place of the autumnal moons, hung low and orange at the frosty edges of the pines. It is the place of frost and silence, the red barn and the sound of the stabled hooves, the bright tatters of old circus posters, the wild winter's morning and the wind with the powdery snow that has been howling all night long, the solitude and the branches of the spruce and hemlock piled with snow, the river boats tethered to the wharf, the wild gray snow of storm-whited morning whipping across them. America's the place of the immense and pungent smell of breakfast. The country sausages and the ham and eggs, the smoking wheat cakes and the fragrant coffee. It is the place where you come up through Virginia on the great trains in the night time and rumble slowly across the wide Potomac and see the morning sunlight on the nation's dome at Washington, and where the fat man shaving in the Pullman washroom grunts. What's this? What's this we're coming to, Washington? Yep, this is Washington. You getting off here? Who, me? Oh, no, I'm going on to Baltimore. The place of the corner drug and cigar store with the mixing sharp and sweet smells of perfume and stationery of tobacco and the soda bar, the huge stillness of the water tower, the fading light, the rails secret and alive and trembling with the oncoming train. It is a place of the immense and lonely earth. A place of fat ears and abundance where they grow cotton, corn and wheat, the wine red apples of October, the good tobacco. America's the place where great boats are baying at the harbor's mouth, where great ships are putting out to sea. It is the place where great boats are blowing in the Gulf of Night, and where the river, the dark and secret river, full of strange time, is flowing forever by us to the sea. There will always be the great rivers flowing in the darkness. The rivers that have bounded so many nameless lives, which have girdled the wilderness and so much hard, brilliant and sensational living, so much pain, beauty, ugliness, love and wild exultancy. build great engines yet and grander towers, but always the rivers run, in the day, in the night, in the dark, draining immensely their imperial tides out of the wilderness, washing and flowing by the coasts of the fabulous city, by all the little ticking sounds of time, by all the million lives and deaths of the city. Always the rivers run, and always there will be great ships upon the tide. And in the night, a thousand men have died, while the river, always the river, the dark, eternal river, full of strange, secret time, is flowing by us. By us to the sea. America's the place of trains. The great train shed, dense with smoke and acrid with its smell, full of the slow pantings of a dozen engines, passive as great cats. The mighty station with the ceaseless thronging of its illimitable life. And all of the murmurous, remote and mighty sounds of time forever held there in the station. Tonight, tonight in this America, the great barn shapes and solid shadows in the running sweep of moon-whitened countryside. 
the wailing whistle of the fast express. The flares and steamings on the tracks and the swing and bob of lanterns in the yards. The sudden glare of mighty engines over sleeping faces in the night. The Transcontinental Limited stroking 80 miles an hour across the continent and the small dark towns whipped by like bullets. And there is only the fan-like stroke of the secret immense and lonely earth again. And then there are the mile-long freights with their strong, solid, clanking, heavy loneliness at night and the silent freight of cars that curve away among raw, piney desolations with their promise of new lands and unknown distances. The huge, attentive, gape, emptiness. In the watches of the night, the never sleeping night, the sudden unseen faces, voices, laughter, and farewells upon a lonely little nighttime station, the voices of Americans. Goodbye, Ma. Goodbye, Pa. Goodbye, Johnny. I'll send you my address as soon as I get to camp. Don't forget, send me some letters. Yes. Don't forget. Goodbye. 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 And then the secret, subdued, rustling past the thick green curtains, the low tones That's of the porter. Of the four, sir. And then the whistle cry, the tolling bell. The train mounting to its classic monotone again. And presently the last lights of a little town. The floating void and loneliness of moon haunted earth. gazes down upon the vast desolation of the American coasts and on all the glut and hiss of tides on all the surge and foaming slide of waters on lone beaches the moon blazes down on 18,000 miles of coast on the million sucks and scoops and hollows of the shore and on the great wink of the sea the moon blazes down upon the wilderness. It falls on sleeping woods. It drips through moving trees. It swarms in weaving patterns on the earth. And it fills the cat's still eye with blazing yellow. The moon sleeps over mountains and lays in silence in the desert. And it carves the shadows of great rocks like time. The moon is mixed with flowing rivers. It is buried in the heart of great lakes. And it trembles on the water like bright fish. The moon steeps all the earth in its living substance. It paints continental space with ghostly light. The moonlight sleeps above dark herds, moving with slow grazings in the night. It covers lonely little villages. It falls upon the unbroken undulation of the wilderness. It blazes on windows and moves across the face of sleeping men. Trains cross the continent in a swirl of dust and thunder. The leaves fly down the tracks behind them. The trains cleave through gulch and gully. They rumble with spoke thunder on the bridges above the brown wash of mighty rivers. They toil through the hills. They skirt the rough brown stubble of shorn fields. They whip past empty stations in the little towns. And their great stride pounds its even pulse across America. Field and hill and lift and gulch and hollow 
a plain, a desert, a plantation, a mighty landscape, an immensity of fold and convolution that can never be remembered, that can never be forgotten, that has never been described. Weary with harvest, potent with every fruit and all, rank, crude, unharnessed, everlasting and magnificent, a cry, a space, an ecstasy. Play us a tune on an unbroken spinet and let the bells ring, let the bells ring. Play music now, play us a tune on an unbroken spinet. Do not strike music from old broken keys. Do not make ghosts with faded tinklings on the yellowed board. But play us a tune on an unbroken spinet. Play lively music when the instrument was new. Let us see Mozart playing in the parlor. Let us hear the sounds of the ladies' voices. But more than that, Throw the light of Wednesday morning on the third crusade and let us see Athens on an average day. Let us hear the sound of the voices of the Greeks and observe closely if they were all wise and beautiful at ten o'clock in the morning. Let us see if their limbs were all perfect and their gestures grave and stately. Also let us smell their food and observe the meeting. And hear if only once the sound of a wheel in a street, the texture of just four forgotten moments. Give us the sounds of Egypt on a certain day. Let us hear the voice of King Menkaura, also the voices of the cotton farmers. Let us hear the vast and casual sound of life in these old peoples, their greetings in the street, the voices of the housewives and the merchants. Play us a tune on an unbroken spinet and let us hear the actual voices of old fairs. Let us move backward through our memories and through the memory of the race, let us relive the million forgotten moments of our lives. And let us see the poor people sitting in their rooms in 1597. And let us see the rich man standing with his back before the fire in the Middle Ages. But there are times that are stranger yet. There are times that are stranger than the young knights and the horses and the sounds of the eating taverns. The far time is the time of yesterday. It is the time of early America. It is the voices of the people on Broadway in 1841. It is the sounds of the street in Des Moines in 1887. It is the engines of the early trains of Baltimore in 1853. It is the faces and voices of the early American people who are left up in the wilderness, who are hid from us, whose faces are in mystery. It is the time of the early lithographs. It is the time when the world was green and red and yellow. It is the time of the red barn and the windmill. It is the time of the green lawn and the blue sky and the white excursion steamer in the river and the flags, the streamers, the gay brown and white buntings, the brass bands and the tumult. It is the time of the lures and snares of the wicked city and of the great white way. Aha, me proud beauty, I have you in me power. It is the time of pitfalls that await the innocent country gal with a whale-boned collar and a small waist. I kiss your dainty hand, madame. It is the time of the gilded resorts with mirrors and soft carpets where the mechanical piano played and you bought champagne. Hey, Mamie, bring me a quart of Paul Rojet 75. <laughs> it's the time of the opera and theater parties and the horse show and the late jolly suppers and the walnut dining room. <laughs> it's the time of the 400 and the great names of the millionaires, the Vanderbilts, the Astors, and the Goulds. I say, Perkins, will you buy me a railroad? The time of the powdered flunkies and the $20 favors. Just see this souvenir, Edgar, a genuine oriental antique ostrich fan. It is the time of the canopied, red carpeted sidewalks and the great mansions of Fifth Avenue and the plush marble halls and the time of the fortune hunting noblemen. Will you do me the great honor to become the Countess Cacciatore della Chiappa? It is the time of the dude who wears English clothes and has cuffs on his trousers. I see, old man, are we going to arrive on schedule? 
And he never did anything in his life but spend his old man's money. He never did an honest lick of work in his life. He's not worth powder enough to kill him. The son of a baron comes fooling around any sister of mine, I'll beat the everlasting tar out of him. When the songs they sang were old and sweet. When the songs they sang were like beauties from afar. When people sitting on their porches in the dusk could hear the corner quartet singing Sweet Adeline. When the songs they sang were Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer true. I can't afford a carriage And you look sweet On the seat of a bicycle made for two Oh, the thunder of America's names Its imperial names the names of men and battles, the names of places and great rivers, the mighty names of the states, the names of Antietam, Chancellorsville, Shiloh, Bull Run, Cold Harbor, Brandywine, Saratoga, the names of places, the Nantahala, the Badlands, the Painted Desert, Yosemite, the Little Big Horn, the Cumberland Gap, the continental thunder of the states, the names of Montana, Texas. Arizona, Colorado, Michigan, Maryland, Virginia, the Dakotas, the names of Massachusetts and of rich Ohio, a powerful name of Pennsylvania, the name of old Kentucky, the undulants of Alabama, Nevada, Utah, Minnesota, Illinois. In the oak thickets at the break of day, the hunters lay for bear, the rattle of arrows in the laurel leaves, the war cries around the painted buttes and the majestical names of the Indian nations. Pawnee, Algonquin, Iroquois, Comanche, Seminoles, Cherokee, Sioux, Chickasaws, Arapahoes, Catawbas, Omaha, Tuscaroras, and the names of Powhatan and Sitting Bull, and the name of the great chief, rain in the face. The arrows rattle in the laurel leaves, and the elm roots thread the bones of buried lovers. There have been war cries on the western trails, and on the plains, the gun stock rusts upon a handful of bleached bones. The rails go westward in the dark. Brother, have you seen starlight on the rails? Have you heard the thunder of the fast express? The names of the mighty rails that bind the nation. The wheel thunder of the names that left the continent. The Pennsylvania. The Union Pacific. The Santa Fe. Baltimore and Ohio, Chicago and Northwestern, Louisiana and Northern, Seaboard Airlines, Chicago, Milwaukee and St. Paul, Lackawanna, New York, New Haven and Hart, Denver and Rio Grande. What are the names of the engines, the engineers and the sleeping cars? The great engines of the Pacific type, the 400-ton Thunderbolts, the consolidated type hauling the heavy freights, the 22-wheeler of the Southern Pacific, the streamliners with the proud names. The Rebel, down in the Gulf. The Hiawatha. The Zephyr. The city of Portland. The Comet. The Chief. The 20th Century Liberty. By the waters of life, Lord Tennyson stood among the rocks and stared. He had long hair, his eyes were deep and somber, and he wore a cape. He was a poet. And by the waters of life, Lord Tennyson stood among the cold, gray rocks and commanded the sea to break, break, break. And the sea broke as Lord Tennyson commanded it to do. And his heart was sad and lonely as he watched the stately ships of the Hamburg American Packet Company, first $45 in that first class, go on their haven under the hill. And Lord Tennyson would that his heart could utter the thoughts that arose in him by the waters of life. The names of the mighty rivers, the alluvial gluts, the drains of the continent, 
the throats drink America. The names of the great rivers that are flowing in the darkness, the great mouths, the mighty moors, the vast, wet, coiling, never glutted snakes that drink the continent. Where, sons of men, and in what other land will you find others like them? And where can you match the mighty music of their names? The Monongahela, the Colorado, the Rio Grande, the Columbia, the Tennessee, the Hudson, the Kennebec, the Rappahannock, the Delaware, the Penobscot. The terrible names of the rivers in flood, the rivers that foam and welter in the dark, that smash the levees, that flood the lowlands for 2,000 miles and carry the bones of the cities seaward on their tides, the awful names of the Tennessee, the Arkansas, the Missouri, the Mississippi, and even the little mountain rivers in the season of the floods, the Chesapeake, the Swannanoa, Niagara, the St. Lawrence, the Tom Bigby, the Chattahoochee, the Arizona, the Potomac, these are a few of their great, proud, glittering names fit for the immense and lonely land that they inhabit. I know that America and the people in it are deathless, undiscovered, and immortal, and must live. I think the true discovery of America is before us. I think the true fulfillment of our spirit, of our people, of our mighty and immortal land is yet to come. I think the true discovery of our own democracy is still before us. And I think that all these things are certain as the morning, inevitable as noon. I think I speak for most men living when I say that our America is here, is now, and beckons on before us. And that this glorious assurance is not only our living hope, but our dream to be accomplished. I think the enemy is here before us, too. But I think we know the forms and faces of the enemy. And in the knowledge that we know him and shall meet him and eventually must conquer him is also our living hope. You have been listening to Charles Lawton and Norman Corwin's adaptation and production of Thomas Wolfe. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service.